Good morning and welcome to the Unearthed Detective TV channel on what could be the most difficult film I've ever done. So, I'm going to pose a question. How many times have you said to yourself or your friends, why is it always the same people that continuously find the coins and artefacts, whether it's on their own permissions, whether it's on organised digs, whether it's on commercial rallies, why is it always the same people that find the good stuff and we don't? Well, this could be the answer. So, as the title suggests, the formula for successful detecting pretty much falls into these three categories. You could argue that luck also plays a part. But let's think about it logically for, for, for a split second. Technique. The settings of your particular detector that you're using. And of course the land. If, if the land hasn't been walked over by the ancient people or has been busy in Victorian times or whatever period it might be then your chances of finding anything of note or interest is pretty much diminished. But let's put that to one side for a minute and talk about one of the most crucial parts of metal detecting and that's technique. Now people that haven't got a good technique usually don't find anywhere near as much as the people with a really good technique. Now that sounds pretty much straightforward, doesn't it? But there's a lot of seasoned detectorists out there that have been detecting for a very long time that have got really poor technique. The problem is, how would you tell them that they've got poor technique? You can't go up to them in the field and tap them on the shoulder and say, by the way, you're not swinging that detector correctly because A, you could sound patronising, they could take offence, so it's a very difficult subject to approach with people because in their minds they're probably be thinking they're doing everything correctly. Now let's just go and explore what I mean by poor technique. Now have you just seen those two different types of techniques but almost very similar where people are swinging the detector but as they're moving to the left or right they're lifting the detector up so the coils are swinging up in the air. Now I think this is probably down to two things. Fatigue, when people get tired they're just lifting the machines up to the side because it's probably more comfortable. The bodies are probably telling them that they don't like the way they're detecting, so lift your coil out the way because it's less strenuous, I guess. I guess it's something like that. It's got to be something about the body telling the people that I don't like the way that, that you're supposed to detect. So if you lift your coil at both ends of your swing, it's more comfortable doing that and we can carry on. Now, in front of them, the coils are touching the floor. So when they're touching the floor, they're probably going to find things in that area. But look at the area that they're missing. It's huge, huge. And then you've got the other guys that stand straight up with a, with a straight back. They don't have the detectors set correctly, lengthwise. And the coils are off the floor automatically anyway. And they're just swinging, swinging and swinging. Believe me, it happens up and down the country. It doesn't matter where you are in the country, south or north. There's always people that detect that way. You've seen them on organised digs. You've seen them on commercial rallies. <coughs> you've seen them on invites where people you think you look at them and you think how the hell are they going to find anything how the hell are they going to find anything detecting like that and pretty much they don't and then they start blaming the machine they start blaming the land or they start saying well how come they always find stuff and we don't now i'm going to show again what i think is the correct way to detect and also the ground coverage just look at the ground i'm covering when i'm sweeping i go nice and slow and you've got to get that coil right to the surface. There's no point in lifting that coil off the grass or off the stubble or off the plough or whatever it might be. Get that coil down and just have a look at this.
Now by sweeping like that, you're covering your maximum area in front of you. You're not missing anything and that coil is nice and low. You're going nice and slow. So any objects and artifacts, coins in your path, you're going to actually find. So people need to understand that that coil has got to be touching that ground. If you're lifting it off or you, you, you're, for whatever reason, lifting the coil at the end of the sweeps, you're not going to find a great deal. You might be lucky and find one or two nice coins and artifacts over the years or over the calendar month or whatever it might be, but you're missing so much. And that's why people are going behind you on fields and they're finding what you've missed. And you don't want to be doing that. It's all right saying, well, I'll just go out for the fresh air. Go and, go and walk the dog, go and play golf. Detecting is about fines. It's not about the social aspect, going in bigger tents, getting drunk overnight, socialising with your mates, swapping stickers. It's about fines. You're detecting. The whole world, that word metal detecting is about finding things. So you've got to maximise your chances of finding things. That's what this film's all about. Very difficult to, to do this film. Probably the worst subject I could have picked in a lot of ways because you're going to upset people along the way. But it's got to be said. Now the next thing is... Right, we've got technique hopefully out the way. I'm going to show at the end as well the coil going over the grass and how low it's got to be. But the next part of the formula for successful detecting is the settings of the machine. Now, it's all right you having the best metal detector on the planet, but if you haven't got it set right, then it pretty much defeats the object. And there's a growing number of people now that are buying high-end metal detectors or expensive metal detectors. And they're going straight to places like social media and picking up what other people are using settings wise. Now that's fine doing that because it gives you good insight into, into how the metal detector works. But I'm also a great believer of you experimenting yourself. So for example, if you've just bought a really good detector um, and you want to explore its settings, there's nothing stopping you spending a morning in your garden, in a field somewhere with a few coins and artifacts, just listening to the detector sounds, exploring the tone systems of the metal detector what suit you you know you might want to go on a two tone you might want to go on a five tone it's what suits the individual and just experiment with that metal detector rather than jumping in feet first and listening to billy's you know brilliant settings on whatever machine it is and he plasters it all over youtube and social media i'm a great believer of you as a detectorist exploring that detector settings to get the very best out of it now that might take weeks rather than days but at the end you're going to be the winner because you've set that machine to your own requirements you're comfortable with it and you're going to actually find stuff Now settings are one of the most important part of a detector. As you know, you can have the best machine on the planet, but if you don't know what you're doing with it, there's no point in using it. Get to grips with the machine, learn its settings, learn its features, even if it takes months, learn that detector from scratch. By all means, listen to experts on social media about their settings that they use, which is fine, but there's no better way of learning a metal detector yourself by doing the settings, exploring its features and its menu system and tweaking it to your own requirement. If you like two-tone, you stick on two-tone. If you like multi-tone or five-tone, you stick on that. It's all to do with personal preference. Give it a go. And then another part of the formula is land. Now you can get permission just about anywhere in the UK or beyond, and you might be very, very successful. It might have been busy in the early times. The soil might have been really fertile. So the ancient people would have been on that field or those fields because they knew the soil was fertile and they could grow crops and their food. So they were busy on the land. And just remember before the industrial revolution, the vast majority of people were working out in the fields. That was their day to day job. So they pretty much lived and died by the land. And they lost a lot of personal everyday objects along the way that us as detectorists go along afterwards, a few hundred years later, and we find these coins and artifacts and bring them back to life for people to enjoy as much as we do. However, that parcel of land is up on a hillside somewhere where there's only been sheep grazing periodically through the year and there's no known settlement or there's no known village, town nearby, no known footpaths. 
your chances are pretty much diminished. So land is very, very important. Now, I've fallen into the trap over the years of searching what I classed as really poor land, uh, where there's not been a lot of footfall and there's not been a lot of activity. And we've probably been lucky enough to pick up some farmer's coins that he's lost out of his pocket in the Victorian or Edwardian times. Still an enjoyable experience, but you know to dismiss certain areas in favour of others. So land is critical. You could have the best technique on the planet. You could have the best metal detector with your personal go-to settings that you know is going to do the business. But if you haven't got the land, then you're not going to really find a great deal. And you know, the people in the south of, of the UK, you know, the East Anglia area and the Lincolnshire, South Yorkshire, Wiltshire, or these, these sort of places, I'm not going to go and name every single one, but you know there's been a lot of activity around there, so chances are people can walk into a field and over a period of time they can come back with a hammered coin or a Roman coin brooch or whatever it might be. In the north where the population wasn't as big, people have to stick in a little bit more. And those of you that watch the unearthed Team Dicks um, know we do very well. And the reason why we do very well is because of the research that I do on the land and I sometimes dismiss farms in favour of, of others because it's they're pretty much hit and miss and we know there's been a, not a lot of activity there over the years and it's all about putting that effort in to do the research and maximising your chances of finding everything because at the end of the day you could have all these things in line and that one thing would let you down and that's land availability so if anybody is watching this and enjoys it just remember that you're not necessarily doing anything wrong if you've got your technique right and your machine's working correctly it could just be that the, the fact that there's nothing much on the land and you'll know over time whether to dismiss it or not you know I'm a great believer of giving it a good go but there comes a time where you think hang on a minute you know I've wasted two months on this farm now and I've not ever, I've not found a single uh, interesting object um, you know, it's not my machine, I know my machine's working okay, I know my techniques correctly, it's just purely down to the fact that there's been a, a, a not a lot of activity on that particular farm. So they're the things that you put into place to make the successful formula for metal detecting. And of course, we could add good old lady luck. Now, luck does play a part, I think. Um, I don't know if it plays a huge part like the other three things I've just discussed, but I'll give you an example of luck. 2016 autumn time I was detecting on some arable land and I'd not found anything all day much and it got to about three o'clock in the afternoon and I was really sort of dis dismayed really because my friends who, were, who I were detecting with at the time were finding some nice Roman bits and other bits and pieces medieval things and I just thought you know what I'm going to completely change my direction I'm going to head back to where the car is, I wasn't walking back to the car necessarily, but I wanted to be near to the car because as soon as that, uh, that five o'clock time kicked in, I was back. I wanted to be back in that car with my gear off and calling it a bad day. And I just literally walked. I said, this is going to be my last signal. And I just turned to the left to head back in that direction. I got a signal. It was a gold hammered coin of James I. Now, for me, if I didn't have that mindset of thinking... It ain't happening for me, I'm going to walk this way. Just by pure luck, I walked to my left and headed down the, the side of the field. I got a gold hammered and that was the last signal of the day. So A, don't ever give up on a particular field, I guess. But luck does play a part. Luck has mysterious ways of working. You can get up one morning and think I'm not going detecting today and whatever it could be, that changes. You, could, you know what, I might go out for a couple of hours and that couple of hours could be groundbreaking. So look does play a part, but that's the formula for the success of detecting folks. Please leave a comment, like the video, and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.